Welcome to Global Ethics Weekly. I'm Alex Woodson from Carnegie Council in New York City. This week's talk is with Carnegie Council Senior Fellow Alexander Grolock. Alex has had and has affiliations with Cambridge and Harvard. He has a professorship on ethics in Germany. He is Editor-in-Chief of Conditio Humana. Alex writes frequently on topics relating to democracy, liberalism, religion, and recently artificial intelligence. We touched on all of these topics and much more in our wide-ranging talk. You can go to CarnegieCouncil.org for more from Alex, including links to the articles we discuss, a full transcript of this conversation, and the archive of Global Ethics Weekly podcast. For now, here's my talk with Carnegie Council Senior Fellow Alexander Grolock. Alex, thank you so much for coming today. Great to see you again. Yeah, great to see you. Thanks for having me again. I, I can only tell that it's an honor to be back to this uh, program and that I enjoyed my fellowship here for the last two years very much. Thank you. Great. Yeah, we've enjoyed having you as a fellow. Um, so as you said, you've been a fellow here for two years. There's been a lot that's happened in the world in the last two years since 2017. So where are we as far as liberal democracy? Are, are things better? Are things worse? Just kind of set the stage for us where we are right yeah, now. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's a great question. And like two years ago, uh, you know, we had like the election in the United States and we had the Brexit referendum. So in uh, big picture wise, if you remember 25 years ago, we had two directions. The one said like was the Fukuyama thing saying mm -hmm. like we go towards the end of history and liberal democracy will prevail. And it was Huntington and Harvard saying like, no, this is going to be, we're going to see the clash of civilizations. And basically those two with their books actually coined terms that are like around in the discussion ever since. And there has been sort of a consensus that Huntington is more right than Fukuyama. And looking into the last two years, I would actually say, no, that's not the case. We, we see, of course, several centers of gravity nowadays. But overarchingly, we have two groups of countries. One are the democratic countries. And by that, I mean constitutional countries that are based on human rights and therefore deploy uh, the rule of law based on these human rights and the other nations. So even though they are like very nuanced and democracy in Taiwan is different than democracy in Canada, those countries are, as they call it in diplomacy, like-minded countries, and they share much more as that separates them. So I'd say this is where we stand now. We see much clearer where the world is headed. And it's going to be, for better or worse, again, like a two-block sort of world. Yeah. Um, and so you have an upcoming book as well. It's on identity, identity empathy, and democracy. I know empathy is something that you think about a lot. I think you wrote something very recently about yeah. empathy. So what, what do you really mean by empathy in, in this context when, when it comes to, to politics and, and democracy? When we talk about the liberal world order, what act do we actually really mean? And you can narrow that down to a few, a few things. And very often you hear the term collaboration. And that's what the international order is about. And it's different than it used to be in democracies or republics before the Second World War. But even that, like your willingness to cooperate um, rests upon like empathy. Empathy meaning like it's grounded in, in ratio, in reasoning, but it's also like reflecting on the emotional side of things. And I guess this is like, it, this is what, what this world order, you know, revolves around. And if you look in the opposite, the opposite would be the resentment. And the resentment is like, you know, this is us and there's them and we are better than the others. So this us versus them, which is based on resentment, cannot come to um, how say, reasonable c c conclusions or solutions for, for policy problems. And that's why, why, why I think it's so important to revolve around empathy. And I give you one example, um, the refugee crisis in Europe. If you look at it with empathy, it's clear that we cannot in Europe take in all uh, refugees from Africa, for instance. But it's like also part of empathy to understand and try to understand why these people leave and want to be coming and heading towards Europe. And that's what I mean by empathy. And if you look into the Salvinis in Italy or the AFD in Germany or the UKIP in, in England, you to, you, there's a total lack of this empathy and of this will of understanding what are the motivators of others. So one thing that might feed into this I know this is something that you've written about, is coming to grips with, with your past. Um, in the United States, I, I know you've written about the Civil War and Confederate monuments are still an issue. Um, in Taiwan, you've written about their dictatorial past and how they have a democracy now. Uh, in Germany, obviously, there, there's a lot in their past that Germany has to, has to come to grips with and maybe is still working on that. 
So can we can we get to it? Does, does that feed into something like UKIP or something like these the rise of these far right groups in, in, in Germany and throughout yeah. Europe? That the fact that we haven't come to grips collectively with, with with our with our past and things that we've done wrong in the past. Like uh, Fukuyama was under the impression that there's more and more countries joining the democratic club, and that also means. You know, by definition, there have not been democracies before. So Taiwan, that you mentioned, is now a democracy for roughly a quarter century. But before that, it was a dictatorship too. Um, Germany now reunified for almost 30 years, uh, but the East remained a, a, a dictatorship until 1889. So what happened after the fall of the wall was that like former perpetrators and victims lived in the same street, people from the secret police and their victims. So of course, in order to then establish and build a new form of society, you, you, you have to look into your past and be like quite uh, adamant and firm about it. And I know this is, this is hard and the Germans also like after World War II needed one generation to then be confronted by the next generation in the 68 movement when they asked their parents or dad what did you do in the war so it is not it's all all but easy to confront yourself with the past and I'm I'm not sure if there's like a, a direct link between not doing that and ending up at UKIP or something but you see like in, we have like this new right movements in all of Germany, but there is like more to it in the former East. And that has to do in, in Germany's context that like after the war ended and the East became the GDR in a communist country, they made it by definition the anti-fascist sort of country, which then meant there is no fascists in this country, they are all, they're all in the West, mm -hmm. okay, and that, that prevented from talking about the, the, the Nazi time in the GDR, which then of course leads to like today having more like neo-Nazis in this part of our country. And I guess that's something that if you do not look into the past and if you're not willing to learn from it, then of course you may be ending up, and this is what you said about this country, like 150 years after the Civil War, still not being at terms with your past. So do you have strategies, ideas for how to really Con confront your past and, and to work towards this empathy that, that you're talking about? So, I mean, the, uh, in a, I mean, I don't have like a three point, you know, what sure. we're going to do, but um, if you talk to, let's say, in this country, mild Republicans or like conservatives in Europe, I mean, there is very often between the left and the right, there is only um, a disagreement in the tools what to be mm. done policy-wise. But like in this country, in my opinion, Democrats and Republicans alike wanna like secure the borders. It's just like Mr. Trump coming up with this wall, which is for a variety of reasons seems to not be like feasible and re reasonable, but it also comes with a very divisive rhetoric. So, and that's what I mean by empathy. Like you, you got to secure the borders and I guess like many Democrats and Republicans agree on that, but like how you perceive, uh, how, you, how, you, how you try to achieve that, that may be, that may be um, a much of a difference. And so you could talk to these, um, like, let's say, mild conservatives, if you mm -hmm. will, like reasonable conservatives. And I think uh, there is a difference between nationalism and patriotism. And that's also something that is true in many countries I observe. If you are a patriot, you love your country and you know other people do love their country too. And that creates a bond actually. But if you are nationalist, you believe that your country is better than the others. And that's when it all starts going downhill. So there is no, there is no shame in loving your country. And I'm uh, quite aware here in the United States, Democrats and re Republicans love their country alike. But when you enter this with this nationalistic twist, which makes like you better than the others, which you see in India, in China, in many mm -hmm. parts of the world, it's not mm -hmm. only to this, in this country, it's also in Germany. Uh, I think then it's, that's when it starts to go downhill. So you mentioned China, and this is something that you, you've written about as well, the, the Uyghur detention, the Uyghur repression whatever you want to call it, in, in Western China. Um, you know, there could be a million people in what some people are calling concentration camps in Western China. This is a very clear example of nationalism gone extremely wrong. And you've written that Germany has a responsibility more than other, other nations to intervene to do something about it. So what, what do you really mean? What should Germany be doing in, in this situation with, with China and, and the Uyghurs? I mean, the, the situation is is sad in, in many regards, but it's super sad also that in, in, the, in the sense that 
you wonder why the Chinese leadership did that. If you look into the economic development and the societal development of China, you could say like from Hong Kong to like you just, if you have this whole country and like everything beneath that line in the south is going great, like economically wise, there's Shenzhen, a huge hub, and there's plenty of other uh, cities that do, do well. So why going north of that line and having like Tibet and, and Xinjiang and also the Inner Mongolia where you have the some would argue occupied territories and others would say that's part of China. We mm -hmm. won't go there, but like there is no need actually to change the policy that has been in, in effect until Xi Jinping came to power, which was like to somewhat, I mean, there was a Han dominance, but it was like still like trying to manage somehow the other ethnicities. But now this all changed to an extent that from what we know now, there is up to a million people like in concentration camps, but due to because of their, let's say, uh, identity in ethnic and religious regards, if you will. And I think this is utterly shocking. And I guess when all the things came to happen in Tibet, like Europe and the United States were still kept in the aftermath of World War II, so we didn't really pay attention to that. But this cultural, some call it cultural genocide or whatever, I mean, the thing is, as a German, we know from detaining people and putting them into a camp for features of their character, there's not a, a, a that's not a long road to then just say oh let's why don't we extinguish them and that's like a maybe the Chinese do not plan to do that but from the German perspective we do know it's a short way mm -hmm. and also now I think the balance we are out of balance like the advantages of dealing with a trading partner like China such a big market everybody's excited the Germans are also excited much more than the soybean exporting in Americans like we export like cars and machinery like really like that's you know that's what drives the export nation Germany but when it comes to uh, you know genocidal tendencies genocide is not an opinion it's also not a legitimate policy measure so I think the Federal Republic of Germany and our European allies we have to make that quite clear to the People's Republic of China that we do not uh, except these um, concentration camps. And I'm happy that there have been some s signs that internationally policymakers are not willing to keep up with China in that sense. Uh, what, are, what are the signs that, that you've been seeing? Well, I mean, like in earlier this year, there has been like China has been deploying another harsh wave of rhetoric towards Taiwan and the German foreign minister and the British and the French one, if I'm not mistaken, they all made statements uh, declaring that the People's Republic should like, you know, soften their tone and rather try to work on a peaceful solution with Taiwan than like th uh, uh, war threats. And I think that's where you, I, th I think you can see in the last two years also that the world has been changing its perspective on China's ambition and that means Xi Jinping's ambition. Yeah. Uh, you see that in the United States, definitely. I think kind of both sides have agreed that China kind of needs to be contained a bit more than it has been. But uh, just to push this a little further, so I, I guess the way to hit back at China, you don't want to obviously get into a war with China. You might, you might hit back economically. That could, China is a huge part of the global economy. Is, is are people in Europe, are people in the United States ready to go through a recession, go through a depression maybe because of, of, the, of the weaker repression in China? I mean, is, is that the right way to, to think about this? Or? Well, I mean, China still can like decide where it wants to be. And you feel like in the rhetoric also of Xi Jinping that China, the People's Republic, wants to become a part of the international community. And that's at least like outside its borders, inside its borders, it's like a different uh, story. But still, there is a tendency and a leniency to become like such a responsible partner. And that would, of course, by definition, exclude concentration camps and all sort of measures that come with it. Um, so China is indeed like has to make amends and, and, and figure out where they want to go. But again, like what I said about the Fukuyama thesis, you now see, if you look in Syria, you have China and Turkey and Iran like meddling. And now you have the Russians saying to the Chinese, oh, why don't we work closer together? Again, you see like the formation of camps. And that also like that highlights what I, what I, what I believe is what we see, that the world is like splitting up again into two larger camps. And, uh, and by, by this tendency, I'd say like China has to make uh, again, the decision were on which side it, it wants to stand. And Xi Jinping has changed the policies of the country. Last year, this year, they celebrated 40 years of Deng Xiaoping's reforms. And Deng Xiaoping once was asked why he's been like 
dealing with the Americans and he was saying like every country that dealt with the Americans was better off afterwards. So there has been like, and under uh, Zhu Hintao, who was before Xi Jinping, there has been an opening of society, even like a sort of a slight opening for civil society. So now Xi Jinping goes around and says, we have the party and we have Confucianism, so we don't need democracy, meaning we don't need civil society. And you just know until recently they had it, like at least like mm -hmm. tiny openings in Taiwan. I think that's why she, she really hates the Taiwanese um, model, if you will, because there's Han Chinese like exercising liberal democracy. And actually, if you come to the island, I mean, it's you can feel it that people are free to say what they want. They speak their minds and uh, they enjoy life. And that's basically different to many parts of China. You mentioned that the world is being divided into different camps. But what's interesting about that is that I think you make this point in one of your articles about China is that we shouldn't blame the Chinese people for I mean, that's an obvious point, but it still needs to be said. We shouldn't blame the Chinese people for the decisions of their government. Um, you see that in America with, you know, Donald Trump's approval ratings are very low. Um, you would consider America to be part of the democratic world. But you see Trump, uh, friends with uh, Erdogan, Duterte, uh, Kim Jong-un, maybe. Um, so it, it's just kind of a, a contradiction there that you have the citizens of, of countries that might want to be part of this, this democratic world order, but, but the leaders have, have very, different, very different thoughts. The thing about President Trump, um, and I think this is in the true sense of the matter, un-American, uh, is that he like, prefers the right of the strongest before the rule of law. And I guess that makes him very un-American. Mm -hmm. And that, I guess also there's no, no, no doubt about it. And that's like, and you see what is like, um, what I believe is enshrined or embodied in our world order. It's not very obvious, but it rests on human rights, as I said. But who guarantees these human rights? States do by granting citizenship. So if I'm a German citizen in Germany, I'm under the constitution and there are certain rights and privileges that never can be taken away from me because I'm a German and this is regardless of my denomination, my religion, my racial background, whatever. So that's basically what we deployed and where the thoughts of enlightenment and, and humanism came into like the realm of polity and policy and this is where the world rests upon. So if you now look into Putin, Erdogan, whatever, like they would just always refer to the right of Mm, the stronger, which is again like this is like a rollback before like let's say the 1600s, which when Thomas Hob Hobbes wrote about the war of all against all, I don't know if that's the proper English translation of it, and this was this natural state that he wanted to overcome urgently. And people like Trump, like by admiring the so-called strong man or strong person or strong woman, um, you just you you defy this order that rests upon the rule of law and then like if you look into the track records of these strong persons they all like tank the economies of their countries like look if yours if your son-in-law is running the central bank and you are the president clearly you cannot make any measures about how valid how valid your economy is as you see in turkey you see it in russia and now you also see, start seeing the signs in china where you, where you, where you can, where you, at least the tendency is clear that the leadership style of Xi Jinping is like not well received by international markets. So even their strongest points, also President Trump's make it like these are strong men and they know how to run their country. No, they don't. They tank their country. So that's basically as that's a fact, economically speaking. Yeah. So I, I want to move on to uh, artificial intelligence AI. This is something um, you, you recently became editor in chief of. Condition Humana, mm -hmm. As, um, congratulations on that. Thank that's, you. That, yeah. that, that's, that sounds great. So I know you've written a lot of, about this. Um, how, how do you see AI changing democracy? We, we, we've talked a lot about here about how AI is going to change work and how it's going to change war. But how, how do you think it's going to change democracy? There, there's, I think, no doubt about the fact that democracy is needs an update, is out of balance, has a flaw, is in crisis, and what is that? And, you, and to one degree or the other, you see this in all democratic nations, that GDP is rising, whereas household income is stagnating. There's also no much doubt about these sort of figures. So, and this is due to automatization. Not everything that we, that we you know, f um, have under this umbrella is AI, but like, you know, mm -hmm. it's buzzwords AI, uh, digitalization, automatization. It's an ongoing process and we see it accelerated in the last quarter century. I mean, one can say that, that before that in the Industrial Revolution it was slower. 
So what does this mean? That you, you look at the figures of a society and you think, oh, like uh, people are more are better off and whatever, but they are not. So they cannot participate in in society in democracy as they should be. And America is actually a shockingly stunning example because for the longest time in history, the United States, other than countries in Europe, were eager to accept inequalities as long as people could really make it from wrecks to riches. And we, you see this nowadays. When I was a kid, uh, the United States um, had the most agile and mobile um, society. People would move from Nebraska to whatever, Georgia, to, to take on a new job. And nowadays you see they are not. Uh, they're just sticking and they also stick back to the families, which also like highlights a bit like the fact of like us versus them kind of thing, because you are more confined to your, let's say, like family and you, you, re you cannot participate in the promises of democracy. And you see this to one degree or the other in other countries. The good, the good news is that, we, uh, that only one country has to fix it and then it is going to be like applicable to all other democratic countries. So I, I believe we need, to, we need to discuss about AI therefore because it's like having this huge impact on the fabric of democracies. And, uh, and again like another last point about like why work because in Protestant nations like this or Germany like work and the ethic of work and the narrative of work has, has huge implications on the social status, the, the identity of oneself. So if we now get like challenged by AI, whatever that, that means, it will have repercussions on our identities in a moment where we already struggle with our identity. So yeah, this, is, this leads into what I want to talk about. You mentioned rags to riches, uh, in quotes, uh, mm. Protestant work ethic. These are things that, as an American, um, you grew up hearing about. And you're supposed to work hard, you're supposed to have a job. You know, that, that's what it means to be a part of American society. Um, you said Germany, you think Germany is, is a similar type of society in, in that regard? Um, are other European nations, so do, do, you, do you think, does that make a nation like the United States or Germany, are they, are they, are they going to have a tougher time dealing with job automation as opposed to maybe other European nations or other Asian nations in, in your opinion? Well, I guess like the impact will be the same. I'm just, what I mean is like, I mean, the, the there's so much to be said about the Protestant work ethic and it's just, it's a term, right? But it's like, it's, it's culturally implemented. One of my first visits to this country was in 1995 and I went with a friend from high school who spent a year in the Midwest with family. So we were going to an outlet to get like jeans super cheap because they were here much cheaper than back home. So, and there were like all these lads lined up in front of the, um, the, the changing thing mm -hmm. and they were waiting for their spouses or whatever. And all these men would talk about what they work. And you could clearly see they had different jobs, they had different backgrounds, but there was like a huge respect for the other working. So this one bank guy was talking to this guy who had two delivery jobs. And that's actually what we perceived from the continent, from the old world, about the new world, that if you work hard and if you, you know, you have something to talk about. It's just, and this is also like the, the basis of respect. So clearly that has something, this is deeply entrenched in the American mentality, which is like, I mean, we would call it back then it's like too hyper capitalist, which as a European Catholic, I think you put too much emphasis on work and like being on fire all the time. But like still this made like the engine of this country go. So you so you when I work on narratives of identity, it's about these underlying deep traits. And I always say this example, uh, we in in German, in the Latin languages in English, we say the sun rises and sets. And we know for 400 years that's not the case, but we are very slow in adopting. <laughs> so our underlying currents, our, our narratives of identity, they root very deep. And we may, not, we may see this as the, as the last, but that's actually the most uh, imminent and most important thing to, to look at. So I, I want to ask you this, this question because um, on the stage about a year ago, Stephanie Tsai, who you had an interview with as well, he talked to Andrew Yang, mm -hmm. who is an entrepreneur. He's a 2020 Democratic presidential candidate. I know him, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and so his, uh, his big idea is universal basic income, $1,000 a month for every American to kind of offset the automation job losses. What, and th this, is, this is probably our, one of our most popular videos on YouTube that we've ever, we've ever posted. We get I've moderated mm -hmm. comments every day. There's a very interesting discussion happening in the comment section. It's pretty respectful which is you don't see too often in mm. YouTube comments. So there's great interest in universal basic income. 
there are obviously arguments for and against and so, so where do you come down on universal basic income? I mean obviously you, you know Germany better than any other country. But what, what, what are your general thoughts on, on that? Yeah. Um, so everything that tries to deal with the fact that GDP is rising and household income is stagnating, it's welcome to me. Be it robot tax, be it basic universal income, because it changes over time our perception of the nature of work, whatever. So it's not necessarily about whether or not this is the policy uh, measure that's going to be taken, but it's, it's important to think about it. So uh, to think about new models or options. I feel like they tried in Finland and they were not really happy with the results. And I, people, and again, this leads back to empathy, people want fairness. So the whole crisis now broke because after the, the Lehman Brothers collapse and, and President Obama taking like the measures from the old toolbox, creating new jobs, which was great. But why are people not satisfied and why was Trump elected? I mean, this is a stretch now, but also amongst other things, because the feeling of fairness has been um, shattered and attacked and uh, not treasured and cherished, however you want to say it. So you need to have a certain fairness. And that also implies somebody who wants to work harder gets more. So, but what is the implication of basic universal income? You have a thousand dollars, for instance, or a thousand euros, and you can pay stuff with it, okay? But you could also like try the other way around and say, um, we have a thousand dollars per person, and we invest this in schools and healthcare. Because clearly there is no democracy if you have no equal access to um, education and to healthcare. Why healthcare? Because you know if people are you know um, uh, starving or like at the verge of starvation, it's reducing the IQ because they are like now there's proof for that they are like you know so in anxiety for the survival that clearly if you have education and healthcare, you provide the basis a base a base civic rights and social rights, what does it mean, what is, what is it worth you can go to vote if you have nothing to eat or if you cannot go to school, whatever. So I would highly uh, recommend to take these thousand dollars and make like and restore the foundations of democracy, which is equal access to the fabric of society. And I feel that's only possible through education and healthcare. And now you make the math in your country and uh, then you know why the democracy is in crisis here. So you're saying that thousand dollars times 350 million and instead we should use that to make society better. I feel I like that what we know for now when it comes to basic universal income, which I am sympathetic towards in its result, but the, but the same result can be achieved with another measure, meaning if you have to spend a thousand dollars less a month, it's the same, it's the same uh, um, um, uh, effect. Sure. So, but like the, the measurement, if you get if you get getting thousand dollars, you will have like this discussion. People buy cigarettes and trucks and all these kind of things. But whereas, if we know there's a thousand dollars each month for each person, and this is invested in schools and in healthcare, so that's also something. Then you don't have to pay for your healthcare anymore, or you don't have to pay like that much of tuition. So that means you have more money in your pocket by the end of the month, which is the same effect. Mm -hmm. Something of that sort has to happen, and it has to happen with humans or the human being, their mensch, this is what Conditio Humana also means as the title of this magazine, has to be at the center. It's not about to cater to this industry or that or to a high, higher profit margin or whatever. It, democracy revolves around people and not about pro around profits. And if you, if you readjust that, then you come to the conclusion that you need education and healthcare for everyone. And I guess also the stability of European democracy is also due to that uh, compared to the United States. Yeah, um, seems like that's a tough sell, though. Universal education, universal healthcare, and maybe universal basic. I mean, it, yeah, it, it but it's, I, I mean, I, I, I feel like, and this is really a, a feeling. Like, if you look into the, they call it the axiomatic shift. Back in the days, it was left and right, capital and working class, and now it's more the cosmopolitans and the non-cosmopolitans, the anywheres and the somewheres. And um, we can talk about this too because it's very prevalent in this country also. But what I. Uh, what I think in, in this value shift, like at least in this cosmo, I mean, all these so-called cosmopolitans or anywhere else, they have better education, they ha are better connected, they have better salary. So clearly a good education pays off. You can see it in every society. So to just say, oh no, like education for everyone is crap. I mean, where's the proof? I mean, you, 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 you just, you complain about these well-connected elites. Why are they so well-connected? Because they have a college degree. So now there's the question, how could they obtain it? Oh, because their parents had money in less. So see, if you had like Germany after the war, we call it the, the hour zero. And like, so I'm from the Catholic countryside of Germany. So back before the war, 
only every now and then one male would make like make it to higher education and then to a college because he became a priest. So, but after the war and when we had like equal conditions for everyone to enter schooling, now in my village, not only I went to university and have PhDs, I have doctors and lawyers and whatever, chemical like engineers friends who are from this village. So you can totally see by the Western German example that if you have like the urge of creating like a new middle class, you can, you can, you have the resources, your whole people and not just this tiny elite who went to Harvard and Yale. Yeah, I totally agree. So. I know you also have some thoughts on AI as it relates to religion. So as AI becomes more ubiquitous, what happens to religion? What, what happens to, to people who you know, really are, are religious and, and spiritual? In, in, the Enlightenment, in the Enlightenment period, they thought that everything else but ethics as an aspect of, aspect of religion would vanish over time. And this has not happened. And I'm neither making a case for Nietzsche or for all the others like who were like classy atheists in that sense. I think what we know nowadays is that our identity revolves around a variety of things. Religion or what comes as religion is one large part of it. Last year, the Pew Institute in, in Washington, they did a survey amongst Europeans. And I'm not sure which European countries now out of, out of my mind were involved. But they were asking about Christianity and religious affiliation. So there were 90% of those surveyed who could remember they were baptized at some point, which is already like, you know, if you don't give anything about it, you would not know it, you would have forgotten it. 70% of these people said like they try to, do, to live according Christian values. This is also very blurry, but still they say that. But only 20% out, out of all of those went to church regularly. So you see there is a clear and a strong um, religion and the, the, the narratives religion has and um, the rights it provides and yeah the rituals you know from Christmas tree to whatever uh, they have a deep impact on us so religion is not gonna go because that's actually I think what they couldn't see in the Enlightenment period how important it is for for um, the fabric of societies and this is why I'm still saying like yeah Europe we have Christian societies but the question then is what does it mean so where does this lead to and what is the real impact of Christianity in onto politics and frankly saying like if I look into Mr. Orban's Hungary or whatever he can just keep his Catholicism to himself because I think that's not really helpful in terms of policies but that's my opinion but this is but what would change in the in the in the time of AI uh, I have been getting criticism for that, but I believe like what religions provide are these big narratives and that's what makes them like Harari says it in his book uh, uh, Homo sapiens, like it's, the, it's mythology, religion and gossip that keeps our societies afloat. So religions were designed or came about in a time where people lived for maybe 30 years. Uh, so when Jesus walked the earth, that's approximately the age and then you talk about um, for instance, like um, marriage and in Catholicism that you cannot divorce. But nowadays we live maybe up to 100 children born now, they will be living much longer. So they may get divorced after 30 years of marriage saying like, you know, and Catholicism cannot adjust to these new realities. So the rights that religion provide and all do is like birth, fertility, adolescence, getting married and your own children and then you die. But they have nothing to provide for a lifespan that is 80 or 100 years. So I'd not argue that religion will vanish completely, but I think only religions will survive that can adjust to this new sort of like lifespan that humans have and be able to accompany humans through these passages of life. And we will see religions going out of business, if you will, that mm. cannot adjust. Would, um I mean, would Catholicism be a religion that, that would go out of business? I, mean, oh, that, 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 yeah. I, I know yeah, this might yeah. be a tough question oh, for yes. you, yeah. but that, that, that's a religion that has, has not been able to adjust in a lot of ways. That's actually uh, the interesting thing, and I'm Catholic myself, it's like if you look into, I mean, culturally Catholic in the sense we just were talking about. Yeah. Um, so the church already lost its people in the 60s when they, the ban on contraceptiva happened and like people would already like, you know, start, like in the generation, my grandfather had eight siblings, in my mom's generation, it's maybe two or three. So clearly they either had less sex or they used contraceptives. So which one is it, okay? Mm -hmm. And, but that is like, it's a tendency where I, where I say, you're right, Catholicism has been like, particularly like difficulties in adjusting. And now you see, you have these, this global community of 1.2 or 3 billion people 
and clearly in the let's say in Europe, um, the Catholic bishops are more eager to discuss uh, or the, um, um, the end of celibacy, for instance. Whereas in other parts of the world, it's not. So there is a lot of pressure on this worldwide community, and I, I, there is also a chance we see it breaking up, not only because of the things I mentioned, but also because of the abuse scandal, which highlights a structural problem in, 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 in many ways. So yeah, I mean, as a, as a cultural Catholic, I cannot imagine a world without Catholicism, because yeah. basically the, all the rights, and I, I enjoy them, and I grew up with them, but the church has like, faces lots of difficulties, and we, when I, I mean, I'm now 40, like in another 40 years time, I'm not sure if the church I knew from childhood will still exist. So just to wrap up on a positive note, a hopeful note, uh, you, you've also written that Malaysia, you, you see Malaysia as a hopeful case for, for democracy. So why, why is that? We, we don't really get to talk to Malaysia too much here. And, so so why, yeah. why, why Malaysia? And I'm actually like really not an expert either, but I see like the developments in, in the last year and why I find this hopeful is it's a country with a majority of, of Muslims and very often you hear the argument, especially in Western Europe, um, we are, by the way, not ra racial racist, but cultural racist, which is not say, oh, these people are inferior, say, mm, this culture may not be able to adapt to whatever standards, okay? So, but if you, which is stupid, but like, you see democracy, human rights has, is, is, how say, it's, Perceivable, believable, however, is in, in in any cultural regard. When you put empathy in the in in the middle, and you say we as humans have to come to terms about us as humans, you you end up with the Europe, which is a European idea of human rights, but it's also accepted in all in all cultures that we know. So to be a democrat doesn't mean like you vouch for a presidential or parliamentary system. It it means you vouch for a constitutional system that places the human in the center and human rights. And these human rights come in civic and in social rights as well, because just having it on a, you know, written down and hung up on the wall, it doesn't help you. And that's actually something where I, where I find like Malaysia um, interesting that they have come to terms with the, also with the past and with like a one party rule. And now they they try to Im implement higher um, um, standards of, of of freedom of press and whatnot, which is I don't know where this is going to head. But for the global discourse on the future of democracy, it shows again that from Japan to Canada, regardless what ethnicity and religion people may have, the idea of human rights and to enshrine them and live under the rule of law, uh, that is like um, super aspirable still. And I don't see like Fukuyama in retreat, but like you know on the march. Great. Well, uh, this is this has been a great conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thank I you very much. much. Thanks. Thanks for your time.